Good morning, and welcome to President Lincoln's Cottage. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, though, as you can see by the chairs, we're going to be waiting for a lot more people to fill in, um, and that's fine, but uh, just expect that that will be happening throughout the morning. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones or any other electronic devices you have at this time. Um, welcome to our fourth annual Lincoln Ideas Forum, exploring the intersection of President Lincoln's life and legacy with contemporary issues. We launched this program in 2015 for the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's last visit to President Lincoln's cottage the day before his assassination, which is today in history, April 13th. Our goal is to commemorate the ideas Lincoln nurtured and the work he accomplished while living here, as well as focusing a light on the unfinished work um, that we all have before us. Less than three months after he issued the preliminary emancipation proclamation, Abraham Lincoln submitted his annual message to Congress in December of 1862. In it, he defended his emancipation policy ahead of the January 1st deadline for the final proclamation. He then closed with a stirring reminder that future generations would remember this moment. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. Lincoln's words certainly appear prophetic as both his actions and his ideas continue to resonate with us over 150 years after his death. Today, we gather to hear experts, scholars, and members of our audience discuss the contemporary relevance of Lincoln's ideas. To start things, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, David Young. Dr. David Young is executive director of Cliveden on Cliveden Street, <laughs> one of our sister sites affiliated with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Cliveden is located in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. Prior to Cliveden, he was director of the Johnson House, a National Historic Landmark Museum of the Underground Railroad. He has published on Germantown's African American history and on issues related to historic site sustainability. He currently serves as a lecturer in the Graduate Program of Historic Preservation in the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. A Fulbright Fellow in 1993, he has degrees from Northwestern University and an MA and PhD in history from Ohio State University. And most importantly to me, he's a dear friend and colleague. Please join me in welcoming David Young. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here on Friday the 13th on the anniversary of Lincoln's last visit to the cottage. And uh, it's a great honor uh, uh, to be here among colleagues and friends in one of the great historic sites in our country. If, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot escape history, President Lincoln's Cottage is the kind of public history site that shows us a way to escape history. That, in fact, it's an opportunity, not a trap, that history is a, 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 a way forward. And our presentations today will suggest how. I'd like to thank Zach Klinsman and Callie Hawkins and Aaron Mast for having me here today. And you're in for a treat, because all of the speakers today will speak to ways that there are opportunities in history to take us a little bit beyond the idea of just a shrine or simply a forum. A great museum is both. And Lincoln Cottage is a great museum that is not only both a shrine and a forum, like we're here today, but also it points to a third way that I'd like you to consider. And I need to give you a little bit of background for you to understand how some of the links in our presentations today can give us a way forward. Because I'd like to suggest that we can't escape history, and that's our opportunity. So I work at a historic site called Cliveden, and it is on Cliveden Street. And the neighbors have always known it as the Chew Mansion on Cliveden Street. And our work in turning it from a shrine to the American Revolution and the fancy house of the Chu family that lived there until 1972 has been to involve the community to bridge that telling disconnect, to make it uh, agreeable to both sounds, Cliveden and Cliveden. And by doing so, what we did was we took it from a shrine to a forum because the Chu's that lived there were the largest slave owners in Pennsylvania and they owned hundreds of enslaved Africans in Maryland and Delaware plantations. And it surprises people that they're here at a Revolutionary War shrine 
There was slavery in the city that gave the world the Declaration of Independence. So to involve the community in the perspectives we needed, Cliveden went from being a shrine to a forum. We examined the plantation records and we looked at many of the provocative documents, the genealogies, the records that complexified the story. And many of the um, uh, uh, presenters today have elements where there's resonance with the Cliveden story as well. Uh, Catherine Clinton will talk about the iconic figures of, of Southern, uh, she's published on Southern uh, uh, Confederate women and, and uh, uh, Harriet Tubman and how complex the stories are behind even these iconic figures and it's important for us to embrace that. Uh, Daryl Davis will be talking about his encounters with uh, uh, the Klan and Cliveden was a, a site in, is a site in Germantown where on Cliveden Street in the 1940s crosses were burned because in the Germantown section of Philadelphia in, uh, it had the largest membership of the KKK of any section of the city of Philadelphia, the city that gave the world the Declaration of Independence. And if you're running a historic site in a dense urban neighborhood that's a largely African-American population <coughs> at a slave owner's mansion, wouldn't you wanna know that there was a KKK presence in people's memory? So to understand the experience and the memory of that was really important. Um, the, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Mendelssohn will talk about how deep it is and engaging it is to get into the real facts of history through genealogy, through resistance genealogy. And that research can, in fact, allow information to build knowledge that brings a larger sense of experience. Uh, uh, in Jennifer's words, the historical record doesn't lie. And that's an opportunity to escape history. And finally, Jonathan uh, Blanks will discuss uh, the connections with enslavement and the hidden results of the legacies of enslavement and discrimination and imprisonment. We live in a world of results, is effectively what President Lincoln was talking about in not being able to escape history. And I'd like to suggest that effective public history involves a way to get from a shrine to a forum to what Lincoln Cottage does, an experience. This isn't just a celebration of Lincoln the man. There are many ways to do that. There are many monuments that ossify the words in stone. But to have a forum is another, to take it up a notch, uh, to have another co-authored sense of the meaning of the man and his legacy. But in this place where he dined, where he reflected, where he composed his thoughts at the darkest moments in our nation's history that somehow seem resonant again at a moment when we were addressing the essential evil of enslavement that human beings are fundamentally different in value. We now are living in an age where some of those very evils are about to become policy or are very close to being actively implemented as if we can't escape history. But one of the things that Lincoln Cottage does, President Lincoln's Cottage being one of the leaders in the field of public history, is it is embracing the powerful cognitive sense we get in places like this. Whether shrine or forum, we are elevated by being in the place where history happened, in the room where it happened, as it were. And as a result, I mean, consider that National Historic Landmark designation, two of the seven criteria, are meaning and association. So the meaning of the architecture, the meaning of the context. There are three impulses in preservation and conservation. We usually prioritize two of them. The curatorial, which is the facts and the things and the stuff. That's one of our impulses. And it's important to do that effectively. But there's also another impulse, and that's the contextual, the urbanist. What is our sense of the place, and how is it adapted and evolved? So the curatorial and the urbanist have usually been the twin impulses in preservation and adaptation and considering what's important in ways that connects with people. Um, but the third way, I think, is a way for a truly effective public history to be considered. And today, I invite you to consider this with all of our presenters. And effective public history depends on this third pillar, and that is experience. 
the experiential encounter with history is personal in connecting our own sense to the past. The Germans have a word for it called Wirkungsgeschichte. <laughs> Wirkungs, you know, working in Germantown, it comes in handy to know a little <laughs> Germantown. And what it means is we bring our own personal biases to how we encounter the objective facts of the past. So it's important to reckon with the personal. But we also bring a larger sense of all the organizational truths we represent, the organizational truths and the truth of our institutions, such as the slave owner's mansion where I work. I needed my organization to reckon with that, to be an effective partner in our communities, to address our community's needs in Germantown. But a third component is also the experience, and that can come through dialogue, like the dialogic tours that visitors are given at tours of President Lincoln's cottage. And as more and more ex uh, historic sites use things like artistic residencies, or site-specific content using dramatic arts, or technology that draws the documents or the encounters with the past in a more uh, dynamic way, it actually turns out that by an effective public history that brings the personal and the reckoning with our own organizational truths, we can step into something other, an experiential encounter that is shrine, forum, and a shared encounter with the past. And each of our presenters today have looked at elements of this through dialogue, through reckoning more deeply with the historical records, through difficult conversations with people who probably might not have considered you an equal partner. Um, and so when you draw people a little bit out of their own personal, it, you, there is an opportunity to get to something other. And it requires us to hear and to listen and to consider in a safe, respectful environment, a welcoming environment like a forum here today, that not only can we not escape history, in fact, the only way out is through. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, and it is Mr. Daryl Davis, who will talk on how can you hate me when you don't even know me. Uh, Daryl Davis is a Chicago native, and he's a graduate of Howard University with a degree in jazz. We're going to get along just fine. Uh, he's personally been uh, trained uh, by legendary blues, boogie woogie, and rock and roll pianist Pine Top Perkins and Jimmy Johnson. And he's a pianist and vocalist in his own right, as well as a professional, professional actor, author, and lecturer. Lives currently in Maryland. And one time, Daryl was told he'd never seen a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And Daryl <laughs> explained, whoa. Uh, it, they learn from black boogie-woogie pianists. Um, the man uh, found it hard to believe in the black origin of the music, but ultimately became a fan of Daryl's. He extended his journey. Uh, and it turns out this man who's the new fan of Daryl uh, Davis's was a member of the KKK. And this experience had led Daryl to um, become the first author to travel the country interviewing members of the Ku Klux Klan its leaders and its members, and to share those experiences in a book called The Clandestine Relationships, mm -hmm. and a newly uh, released award-winning documentary called Accidental Courtesy. And I'd like you to please give it up for Daryl Davis. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Thank, you, thank you all very much for having me, and it's a real honor to be here. I want to thank uh, Aaron, and Zach and Callie for inviting me to participate here. Well, let's go back. To, I just turned 60 years of age. But we'll go back to when I was 10 years old. I was a, a, the only black scout in a parade of uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, and Brownies. And we were marching from Lexington uh, to Concord, Massachusetts, to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. And somewhere down the parade route, you know, people are cheering us on either side of the uh, street. Somewhere down this parade route, I began getting hit with uh, bottles and rocks and uh, soda pop cans and debris from the street by a small group of white spectators mixed in with the larger crowd. And having never experienced anything like this, 
my first inclination was, oh, those people over there don't like the scouts. It wasn't until all my uh, scout leaders came running and huddled over me with their bodies and escorted me out of the danger that I realized I was the sole target. And I kept asking them why, and they kept saying, shh, move along, Daryl, move along, move along. They never told me why. So when I got home, my mother and father explained what racism was. At the age of 10, I had never heard the word. And I literally did not believe my mom and dad that someone who had never seen me before, someone who had never spoken to me, someone who knew absolutely nothing about me would want to inflict pain upon me for no other reason than the color of my skin. It made no sense, and I couldn't get my head around it, so I didn't believe them. But on April 4th, that same year, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and every major city nearby Boston, right here, Washington, D.C., my hometown, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Los Angeles, New York, all burned to the ground, all over race. And so I formed a question in my mind at that time, as David pointed out, the question was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And for the next 50 years, I've been looking for the answer to that question. Uh, starting in my teens, I bought books on black supremacy, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, uh, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here, the Ku Klux Klan. None of my books had the answer. So as an adult, I figured, you know what? Who better to ask to get the answer to my question than to ask someone who would join an organization who historically their whole premise has been hating those who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe. So I began seeking out members and leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. And I, I started right in Maryland where I live. And I figured I would go up north, go down south, go to the Midwest, go to the West, and interview different Klan leaders and Klan members and put it in a book. Because all the books that I had were written by white authors. There had been no books written by a black author on the Klan except detailing how he escaped a lynching or two, one in the 1930s and one in the 1940s. But I want to be able to sit down face to face and talk with my would-be lynchers and ask them, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? So I had my secretary contact the head of the Ku Klux Klan uh, from Maryland. And a state leader is known as a grand dragon. And a national leader is known as an imperial wizard. So this guy's name was Roger Kelly. And he was the uh, grand dragon from Maryland. He would later become a national leader and imperial wizard. So I had her ask him if he would consent to sitting down and meeting with me and I told her specifically, do not tell him that I'm black. I mean, he'll figure that out if he meets with me, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so at any rate, uh, I didn't want him to know in advance because I, I was told by somebody else who gave me his contact information not to fool with him, that he would kill me. And I wanted him to see me spontaneously because even if he had agreed you know, to meet me knowing that I'm black, he might have time to prepare different answers for a black interviewer than he would have for a white interviewer. So I wanted it all to be candid. So she understood, she called him, he agreed to do the uh, interview, didn't ask what color I was, and we set it up for a motel room up in Frederick, Maryland. And she and I got there, now she's white, she and I got there super early, and I gave her some money, sent her down the hall to get some soda pop out of the machine, put it in the bucket of ice, get it all cold, so I could offer my guest a beverage, depending upon you know, if he came in my room or said I'm not talking to you and walked away or whatever. But I wanted to be hospitable. So she got it all ready. And um, the way the room just happened to be, if you people are in the hallway and the door is here, you have to come through the door, turn to your right, and the room is laid out back here. So you cannot see who's in the room standing out in the hallway. I took the lamp table, took the lamp off, put the table over here in the most obscure corner of the room. And then I had a, um, a bag with uh, blank cassettes in there, put a cassette player in the middle of the table, had a Bible in there because the Klan claims to be a Christian organization, and they claim that the Bible preaches racial separation. Now, I've never seen that, so I want to be able to pull up my Bible and say, here, Mr. Kelly, show me chapter and verse where it says blacks and whites must be separate. So I'm all prepared. Right on time, 515, knock on the door. Mary hops up, runs around the corner, opens the door. In walks what is known as the Grand Nighthawk, a bodyguard to the Grand Dragon. He comes in wearing military camouflage with the uh, Ku Klux Klan insignia right here, which is a red circle, white cross, and a blood drop in the center. Over here are the initials KKK, and across his little barrette is uh, embroidered Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Right here he had a semi-automatic handgun in his holster. He comes in, Mr. Kelly is walking directly behind him in a dark blue suit and tie. 
When the night hawk saw me, he just froze. And Mr. Kelly did not realize this guy stopped short. He slammed into his back. And they stumbled, you know, had to regain their balance. And I realized, I, I could see the apprehension in their face. You know, they're thinking, did, did, did this guy give us the wrong room number downstairs? But, you know, so I got up, I went like this, so to show I had nothing in my hands. And I walked forward and said, hi, Mr. Kelly, I'm Daryl Davis. He shook my hand. So far, so good. I said, come on in. He had a seat. And before I could, and Nighthawk stood at attention to his right. And before I could sit down, Mr. Kelly asked me if I had any, any uh, identification. I gave him my driver's license. And he said, oh, you live on Flax Street in Silver Spring. Now, that had me concerned. I mean, why is he reciting my address? You know, all he has to do is just check my picture, my name. So I said, yes, Mr. Kelly, that is where I live and you live at, and I named his house number and his street. That way I was leveling the playing ground. You know, so if you come visit me, I can come visit you. We should confine all this visiting to this motel room. <laughs> so he smiled, and you know, within a few minutes, he let me know that I was inferior, that black people have smaller brains than white people, uh, we're prone to crime, we're prone to laziness, don't want to work, want to take advantage of government programs, sell drugs, Every stereotype you can imagine, I heard. But I was not there to fight or beat him up or anything like that. I was there to learn, you know, where is all this coming from? Because you cannot address it unless you understand where they're coming from. So I'm just listening, taking all this in, challenging a few things here and there. But every time he would say, Mr. Davis, the Bible says, I'd reach down, pull out my Bible, hand it to him. Or if my cassette ran out, I'd reach down, pull out a blank cassette. Well, every time I reach down like this into my bag, the Nighthawk reached up like this. And I mean, he's doing his job. That's his job to protect his boss. So after a while, he realized there was no threat in the bag. And he relaxed. I went in and out of the bag, no problem. A little over an hour into this interview, there was kind of a strange <laughs> noise. And we all jumped. And I flew out of my chair because I was going to come across that table and snatch Mr. Kelly and the Nighthawk and slam them both down to the ground and take away the Nighthawk's gun. I could not figure out what that noise was. But I knew that he made that noise because I didn't make it, so he must have, must have made it. And because I could not discern it, I perceived it to be an ominous, threatening noise. And I feared for my life. I'm hearing that person's voice in my head, Daryl, don't fool with Roger Kelly, he'll kill you. And I'm thinking, what did I just do? What did I just say to cause him to go off? And when you go into survival mode, you will do one of four things. Anybody would do one of four things. Some people just faint because the fear is so shocking. Other people will just tense up and start shaking. Their muscles lock and they can't move. You can be hitting them on the head. They will not even be deflecting the blows. They just mm, like this. That's called paralysis by fear. You cannot move. Other people will try to run away. And that is the best option, to put as much distance between yourself and the source of your fear as quickly as you can. And that's an option that I would have taken. However, you cannot outrun a bullet in a motel room. So the next and last option is to do a preemptive strike. Get them before they get you. So I was going to come across the table and mitigate the danger to myself and my secretary. When I hit the table, Mr. Kelly is right here, and I'm looking right into his eyes. I didn't say a word, but I knew he could read my eyes. My eyes were asking him, what did you just do? His eyes had locked with mine. He didn't say a word either. But I could read his eyes. His eyes were saying, what did you just do? And the Nighthawk was like this, looking at both of us, like, what did either one of y'all just do? <laughs> well, Mary was over here sitting on top of the dresser. She realized what happened and was explaining it to us when it happened again. The ice in the ice bucket had melted, and the cans of soda fell down the ice. And then it made that same noise again. And we all began laughing at how ignorant we were. Yes. He's the head of the Klan, I'm a black guy. But we were in the same room, at the same table, having a conversation, agreeing, disagreeing, but nothing violent. So this was a teaching moment. I won't say it was a learning moment, but it was a teaching moment. The lesson taught is this. All because some foreign, and underscore, circle, highlight, the word foreign entity, that being the bucket of ice and cans of soda, of which we were ignorant, entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made, we all became fearful and accusatory of one another. Ignorance breeds fear. We fear those things we don't understand. If you don't keep that fear in check, 
that fear in turn will breed hatred because we hate those things that frighten us. If you don't keep that hatred in check, that hatred in turn will breed destruction. We want to destroy those things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? They may have been harmless and we were just ignorant. So we saw the whole chain almost unravel to completion. Now we did see the whole chain unraveled to completion a few months ago on August 12th down in Charlottesville, Virginia, where there was a lot of ignorance, a lot of fear, a lot of hatred that culminated in destruction when a white supremacist got inside his car and tried to kill as many people as he could by running through the protesters. He succeeded in injuring 20 people and murdering a 19-year-old girl, Heather Heyer. So ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. If you want to solve the problem, we need to stop addressing the symptoms of hate and fear and address the source, which is ignorant. You cure that ignorance with education, then there's nothing to fear. If there's nothing to fear, there's nothing to hate. If there's nothing to hate, there's, then there's nothing to destroy. Okay, so uh, Mr. Kelly and I would continue this conversation. No more problems. I went in and out of the bag. No sweat. Um, I would invite him down to my house over here in Silver Spring. He'd come to my house. Sometimes he'd bring his bodyguard who would sit on the couch twirling his gun on his finger like this because he's bored while Mr. Kelly and I talked. I would invite over some of my other white friends, black friends, Jewish friends, just to engage Mr. Kelly in conversation with someone other than me. For two years, he did not invite me to his house. Okay? But by the end of two years, he was coming down to my house by himself. He trusted me that much. And then he got promoted from Grand Dragon state leader to Imperial Wizard, national leader. He began inviting me to his house and to Klan rallies. I would go to these Klan rallies and I'd watch them parade around in their robes and hoods and set this big 25, 30 foot cross on fire and then uh, give speeches and all this kind of thing. Well, he slowly but surely began changing his, uh, his words and his rhetoric. And, and over time, you know, my book came out, but we would still continue getting together and having these meetings, just going out and having dinner together, things like that, things that he would never ordinarily do. But we would talk about the Klan, talk about other things other than the Klan, and eventually he decided this was not for him. And he left the Ku Klux Klan. He quit the Klan, and in doing so, he gave me his robe and hood. This is the robe of the imperial wizard. And this is the emblem that all clan groups use. Okay? When he quit the clan, 200 of his members, a little over 200 of his members, left out. Now that does not mean they're no more racist. Okay? There's simply no more organized racism within his clan group all right, in the state of Maryland. Um, and this, of course, is what's called the hood. This is the hood, this is the mask. Members who want anonymity don't want you to know who they are. They wear this mask and peep at you through these eyelets. If they don't care that their identity is revealed, the mask has three snaps or Velcro. Simply remove the mask and the face is exposed under the hood. Now, I have a bunch of these things from active, I only brought one. I, uh, I get them from active clan members through conversation. We spend too much time in this country talking about each other, talking at each other, or talking past each other. I prefer to sit down and talk with each other. And I'm just a rock and roll piano player. Okay, I'm not a sociologist or psychologist. Maybe I should be because I make more money than I do playing music. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I love rock and roll too much. Okay? But you know, if I, if I can walk away with things like that, anybody in here can do it. I have this theory. When two enemies are talking, they're not fighting. They're talking. They might be yelling and screaming and beating their fists on the table to drive home a point, but at least they're talking. You know, they're not fighting. It's when the conversation ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So we want to keep the conversation going. You know, and it bothers me a great deal that we call ourselves the greatest nation on the face of this earth. Don't get me wrong. I'm very patriotic. I love my country. But I do have some issues with that statement. And let me explain. 
Perhaps technologically we are the greatest. We, Americans, put a man on the moon and we brought him back safely. And while Neil Armstrong was up there talking about one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, we were able to talk with him live all the way to the moon from Earth via satellite radio phone. We invented that technology. Everybody in here has email. Everybody in here has a cell phone. Hit a few words, hit a few numbers. You're talking to people right next door in Virginia, California, Europe, Australia, China, Africa, wherever you want to talk. We invented that technology. So how is it that we as Americans can talk to people as far away as the moon or anywhere on this planet, but yet so many of us have difficulty talking with the person who lives right next door or across the street because he or she is a different skin color, ethnicity, religion, persuasion, what have you. It seems to me that before we can truly call ourselves the greatest, our ideology needs to catch up to our technology. And then we can truly brag. Because folks, look, we are living in the 21st century. This does not belong in the 21st century, or any century for that matter, okay? Neither does what happened in Charlottesville. We are living in space age times where there are way too many of us thinking with Stone Age minds. And what we need to do is we need to sit down and talk with people, even if we don't agree with them. It's fine not to agree, but it's not fine to shut them out. So we need to come to the table and talk and exchange ideas, find out what it is they're fearing about us, what it is that we fear about them. You find that common ground. If you spend five minutes with your worst enemy, you will find something in common. If you spend 10 minutes, you'll find even more. And if you plant that seed and nurture that commonality, it will turn into a relationship. And the things that you have in contrast, like this, begin to matter less and less. So it turns into a relationship. If you nurture that relationship, it will turn into a friendship and can possibly result in things like that. And you know, I'm well aware that there will be people who will go to their grave being hateful, violent, and things like that, and they will never give that up. But there are plenty of people out there who with enough exposure, enough one-on-one -on -one conversation, will think and change. Thank you all very much. So um, after uh, Daryl Davis's dynamic presentation, we turn now to how the Me Too movement is changing college campuses with Dr. Catherine Clinton. Dr. Clinton is the Denman Chair of American, uh, cha uh, holds the Denman Chair of American History at the University of Texas, San Antonio. She's an author and editor of numerous books, over 25 of them. And her first book was The Plantation Mistress, uh, Women's World in the Old South, which appeared uh, in 1982. Her most recent book is Stepdaughters of History, Southern Women in the Civil War which was based on the Fleming lectures she delivered at Louisiana State. She's an elected member of the Society of American Historians, and during 2016, she served as president of the Southern Historical Association and was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. And she's no stranger to Lincoln Cottage. She serves on the scholarly advisory board here at the President Lincoln's Cottage. So without further ado, here is Dr. Catherine Clinton. Thank you so much for that introduction. I want to echo my thanks for the work done by all the staff, but particularly Callie and Zach and Aaron, who have brought me back here. Um, I'm very nostalgic looking out today, remembering uh, a very dusty Lincoln Cottage that I visited before the opening and all the hopes and dreams of trying to bring Lincoln's legacy alive, I think has been really so fulfilled and is so wonderful for me. I'm also nostalgic hearing Daryl speak about uh, uh, many years ago. I'm reminded um, that on April 4th, 1968, I was eagerly anticipating my birthday the next day and getting my driver's license. But uh, Kansas City did burned to the ground in certain areas. And I went to my uh, family members and many adults I knew, and I said, what, what, what happened? What is this about? And that was my first introduction, my first awakening. You were hit by a rock, and I was hit by uh, not understanding my world. And that led me on a journey which began uh, on a college campus um, in Boston and many campuses across the world. And so when I had to reflect upon my career for the presidential address, 
of the Southern Historical Association, I realized that I had been working most of my life on race issues, but also on issues relating to gender and sex, but most importantly, power. And so for my presidential address in uh, 2016, I addressed this question of sex and power because it does bother me. Um, you know, some of my best friends are men. I produced two men. I am well aware of the issues and I do not condemn men. I condemn sexism. I do not, I do not, uh, I, I, I think we need to all work together and that's something I'm sure being in this place really makes me feel. Especially today, we cherish politicians whose integrity reminds us that we, the people, might include all of us. Perhaps no leader was more acutely in tune with these democratic principles than Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln's example might be important for us to recognize. On college campuses, where the vulnerability of young people is a well-known commodity, most predators roam relatively unmolested. The year 2017 witnessed a revolt against climates of intimidation and retaliation. Victims of sexual har harassment are demanding a new era. Uh, in the wake of the Weinstein effect with victims of sexual harassment airing personal testimonies, media, besides a healthy dose of self-examination, inspires vigilance. Students are paving the way with protests and demands for reform. As we gather together today uh, to confront issues of international significance, it's not unreasonable to expect that we look to Lincoln, as always, to give us insight. But we do know that in his own day, his empathy and his emotional intelligence could provide us with some indication of how he might have handled some of the situations. I can say without any hesitation that in my work and my study over the years, it leads me to conclude that Lincoln was not a pussy grabber nor would he have allowed anyone in his circle to be involved in that. And even if he did, I think Mary Lincoln might have cleared that up very quickly. <laughs> in one important aspect, Lincoln discussed race and gender when he confessed, now I protest against that counterfeit logic, which concludes that because I do not want a black woman for a slave, I must necessarily want her for a wife. I need not have her for either, I can just leave her alone. In some respects, she certainly is not my equal, but in her natural rights to eat the bread she earns with her own hands, without asking leave of anyone else, she is my equal and the equal of all others. This is a refrain that's often used to point out his view of egalitarian work. I think it also shows he's including, as an example, a black woman, which is quite significant. Thus, Lincoln imagined autonomy in the workplace and would surely have condemned the kinds of harassment, intimidation, and retaliation that surrounds the topic of sexual harassment on campus. It may be too little too late, but academe now seems willing to confront the obvious. How can we introduce sanctions which will curb not only immoral and toxic behavior, but retaliation against those who file legitimate grievances about violators <coughs> of university rules. An author in Ethics in Education published an article last year that raised the question, relationships between university professors and students, should they be banned? The author, a male, suggests, we examine the question of whether universities and colleges should attempt to ban all student-faculty relationships, as many have tried to do. The author goes on persuasively, paragraph after paragraph, page after page, and concludes that there's a fundamental right to engage in intimate relationships without interference. Therefore, outright bans on such relationships sh could not be upheld. Five women authors in the Journal of Cases in Educational Leadership offer insight into what constitutes sexual harassment and how should administrators handle it. Now, I will give you many examples to say that administrators do know what sexual harassment is. They have known since the early days of my career in the 1970s when I was in the Ivy League school and it arose, and this is when the legislation began. And we can see that there have been directives, there have been laws put in place. Unfortunately, these directives are being dismantled by the current federal administration. So only with vigilance can we move forward to improve a corrosive atmosphere. And I use a quote here, it's about a culture of knowingly harboring and protecting predators while silencing victims. This has been the cry 
of the Me Too campaign. Even with additional federal guidelines and grievances in place, students and junior faculty suffer. And it's only through student protests and media attention that the climate improves. For example, in 2014, UCLA reached a settlement with a historian when he agreed to pay $3,000 fine and accept a one-quarter suspension without pay. And he was removed as head of the Center for Near East Studies. He was also forced to attend a sexual harassment training. But when he returned to campus, there was an uprising on the part of students because the university had wanted to enforce a three-year open door policy. He would only be allowed to meet with students if he kept his door open. This was quite a frequent practice. I can say that uh, I noticed it when I was teaching at another uh, non-Ivy Boston University and a colleague returned and I was told that this was the way to prevent sexual harassment to have a quote open door policy. But should a professor be trusted to be alone with students? Should he be allowed to, who couldn't be trusted to be alone with students, should he be allowed to teach at all? No. And one of the uh, male ralliers, uh, Matthew Kelly, a recent PhD from UCLA, say he harassed, he assaulted, he psychologically terrorized women. And he was paid a, a fine is that what we have now, a sexual assault fee that can be imposed on campuses? By the way, this particular professor was finally fired this spring. A case with an even longer gestation and one to which I was privy began over 30 years ago when I was a junior faculty member at Harvard. Sexual harassment was still a relatively new concept. It only, the, the language was coined the decade before, but the enforcement was, was quite difficult. And I will add that there were sexual harassment guidelines for employment, but what you do with the student-faculty relationship, that was something that was considered, quote, a gray area. A federal court recognized discrimination in education for the first time in a case brought forward in 1977, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission established criteria in 1980. Harvard appears to admonish only two other professors for sexual harassment, uh, Derek Walcott in 1982 and Martin Kilson in the government department in 1979, although, as I will say, I, I, I gave my speech, uh, the Southern uh, social network in, uh, in 2016 where I was able to testify that, that uh, neither one of those professors had been suspended in their activities. Um, as an, an undergraduate accused Walcott of giving her a C as she declined his advances and Kilson would um, openly physically kiss students which caused great uh, intimidation. In 1985 there was a government professor who was forced to resign uh, or who himself resigned after being accused of sexual harassment. He was, by the way, in the government department. Remember, it's about power in sex. It's not just about gender. Um, the New York Times reported in 1995, it's the first time in the university's 348 year history that a professor had left after charges of sexual misconduct were made. Now I want to emphasize that actually there were many charges of sexual misconduct made, but it became quite difficult. In 1981, Terry Carl was a junior faculty member and uh, Jorge Dominguez was her senior colleague. He had tenure, she didn't. He would soon be president of the Latin American Studies Association. She studied Latin America. He sat on the editorial boards of prestigious journals. He was already a name in the field while she was trying to establish hers. I try and give you the context because people always ask, why didn't people avoid contact with certain people? And it is because they controlled, they were the gatekeepers, they controlled power in the field. Dominguez was found guilty by the University of Serious Misconduct. I won't go into it, you can always Google it. He was removed from administrative responsibilities for three years and told that any future misconduct could trigger his dismissal. I assure you, it didn't. And the joke was, when I was on the faculty, how could we, younger women on the faculty, sexually harass so that we would be stripped of our committee responsibilities? <laughs> which was what happened. Uh, you know, I was, I, I was uh, doing some, uh, some uh, speaking with Ethel Klein, my colleague in the field, and uh, she said that he 
Uh, she had a very disturbing encounter when Dominguez wanted to comfort her. He came with some bad news. He came to tell her that she was being denied tenure. By the way, she went on to Columbia. Um, but uh, during that, he asked if he could hug her, and he pressed his erection on her during the process. When she complained to a Harvard administrator telling him about the hug and the erection, uh, he told her, according to Klein, that when Dominguez has to communicate bad news to someone he cares about, he gets emotional. <laughs> Thus, Dominguez steadily climbed the ladder at Harvard. In 1995, he was selected as director of the Weatherford Center. Uh, in 2006, he was made vice provost for international affairs. And in 2014, he traveled with Harvard President Drew Gilpin Faust to Mexico City. A survey of women at the university published in 1984, that was my first year teaching there, showed that sexual harassment was 49% of the non-tenured faculty, 41% of the graduate students, 34% of the undergraduates. Um, and I would say that Harvard still does not have an effective policy, but what is changing is, of course, the willingness of individuals to go public and involve the media. So when Terry Carl reflected in the middle of the Me Too movement on her situation, uh, now retired from Stanford, she um, told her story and um, the consequent publicity around it led to Jorge Dominguez resigning from Harvard, although the university promises it will pursue an investigation. Now this matter of investigation, I'm well aware, is a tender subject because after all, people accused do have a right to due process. But the due process has continued to be how many allegations can you pile up? How many grievances can you put forward? How many does it actually take? Last year, the Boston Globe investigation uncovered a culture of blatant sexual harassment at Berkeley School of Music. Three male professors were allowed to quietly leave since 2008 after students reported being assaulted, groped, or pressured into sex. Administration at the renowned music school tolerated lecherous behavior, former Berkeley students and employees said, and they often silenced those who tried to protest, there were gag orders and settlements. In other words, the most important thing to these institutions is to ma maintain an unblemished, ungoogled reputation. In my own state of Texas, with a faculty member in my field, a prominent person in the Historians Against Slavery movement, um, a student received a text. She had been the organizer of the Black Lives Matter on her campus. She had worked closely with this um, organizing uh, faculty member, he sent her a text, want to get together for dinner, drinks, and a movie? My wife will be away, so it'll just be me. Hashtag lonely. Um, the student shared this email with the Texan uh, news uh, because the vice president had written, my office received allegations of similar behaviors from three other reporters. Because these reports were similar to yours, we extended an investigation, which is still ongoing. He's not teaching right now, but this murkiness continues. And the real problem, like in the Berkeley situation, is a student who charged a grievance found out that Berkeley did indeed dismiss this person, who then went on to another prestigious musical institution, and yet another. Only through contact were these people uh, not allowed to continue. Um, certainly, the student said, when I got that text message, I literally sat in my house for four hours because I didn't know what to say to him. I didn't know how to respond. I'd never been approached that way, especially by a professor. She later couldn't attend the class and dropped down. A young black radical turned inside out by this particular experience. She did say, however, that whistleblowing was something that her professor had taught her. Therefore, <laughs> it was something that she felt was very important. Now, I always thought that the humanities was bad, but I can tell you that the sciences, where women are in deficit, is much, much worse. The case of Jeffrey March, a star astronomer at Berkeley, who was found not guilty of allegations by the university. Professional organizations and graduate students lobbied and protested to the point where March had to resign in October of 2015. Mm -hmm. Earlier that year, there was a rather notorious incident when the Nobel Prize winner for Physiology and Medicine um, went to speak at a conference in South Korea. And he said, it's strange that such a chauvinist monster like me has been asked to speak to women scientists. Let me tell you about my trouble with girls. Three things happen when they're in the lab. You fall in love with them, 
they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. Perhaps we should have separate labs for boys and girls. So these are, he didn't, he was not fired, but he later resigned over these remarks. Now all of this sounds you know, very bleak, but I do want to say that it's important to say that if you do persist, sometimes there can be some light at the end of a tunnel. Imagine a young graduate student going to the University of Rochester, thinking that she might um, enroll in their brain and cognitive science department, working under Dr. Richard Aston. She had her first interaction with a young uh, faculty member, Florian Yeager, a recent department hire who was viewed as a star. Um, there was a complaint filed in August 30th, 2017, which detailed years of sexual harassment by Jaeger, dating back to kids' time as a graduate student. Beyond the documented harassment, there was a hostile work environment. Women were losing educational opportunity as a consequence. I can tell you that our uh, social network allowed for, before Twitter, before Facebook, we still had uh, the telephone. And we could tell people uh, that's not a particularly good uh, school for women, that there's, they may be more vulnerable than at other institutions. But there was a year and a half of efforts internally to deal with the Title IX investigation at the University of Rochester. Um, finally, the EEOC came in, a complainant went forward, uh, there were um, 16 complainants. According to the complaint, Jaeger would host hot tub parties. He would use illegal drugs with students and in one case sent unwanted pictures of his genitals. The complaint became public and the pre president of Rochester suggested that uh, we had to look to protecting these people accused. He even invoked the case, another case at the University of Virginia where there was um, a Rolling Stone article and uh, men involved in alleged incidents were later exonerated. So this notion of he said, she said continues to be an ongoing problem. But there was a federal lawsuit filed in 2017 and during that same month I'm pleased to report that Time magazine named as its person of the year the silence breakers. And I would like to suggest that it is students who have been breaking the silence who've been making some noise on campuses, not just here in the US, but read the headlines at Karachi University. There are students who are protesting a professor who said that if a student wanted to improve her grade, she would have to marry him. <laughs> so there are quite extensive cases. There were uh, trading for favors. And also we can look at the way in which in France, although the Me Too movement has had some pushback professionally, High schoolers took to the streets to say that they were tired of having grades traded for favors in the high schools across France. So I look to this movement very heartening. If people persist, if people use their voices, out of my um, speech two years ago, which was printed in the Journal of Southern History, I received such an outpouring that now we're involved in a project called the Cassandra Project. Because Cassandra was, of course, uh, someone who was given the gift of prophecy, but she didn't know the strings attached to the gift of prophecy. And therefore, when she refused the God who'd given it to her, he said, you will forever be disbelieved. And therefore, I think of Cassandra as the patron saint of sexual harassment victims. So let's all hope that we're in a new era, that um, we can invoke certainly the Lincoln's philosophy of really rising to the occasion of equality of opportunity and lifting our voices and continuing with a healthy democracy that includes all of its citizens, females as well as males. Thank you. Um, we will leave up the podium for our next speakers uh, uh, and uh, you will be treated to Jonathan Blanks who is currently a research associate at the Cato Institute and uh, he is at work as a um, research on a research project on criminal justice. He's also a writer in residence at the Fair Punishment Project for Harvard University. And his research has focused on law enforcement practices, the overcriminalization of society, civil liberties. He's appeared on various television, radio shows, internet media, podcasts you name it, Bloomberg Live, Vice, Vox, The Atlantic, many, many more. He's a graduate of Indiana University. He testifies at Congress all the time. 
He's quite uh, dynamic in his presence on blogs and social media, and I encourage you to get to know his work. He is going to speak today on Hidden in Plain Sight, Revealing America's Injustice System. And it's part of the idea that we live in the world of results. And no matter what the policies or what the plans or what the laws, there are many unintended consequences. And they can be very stark. So let's uh, look up from the microscope a little bit and see what they are. Um, so let's hear from Jonathan Blanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to uh, the Lincoln Cottage, particularly Callie, uh, Aaron, and Zach. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about putting everything in context, putting the past in context, putting the present in context. As, we, as the previous two speakers talked about, we have to better understand the world that we live in. And I want to talk about the institutions as they change over time, American institutions that we've all come to know and we all think that we understand. And of course, dealing here at the Lincoln Cottage, we have to talk about the institution of slavery. And this history of slavery on the American continent began actually with indentured servitude from Europe. And what this was, what, I mean, it wasn't an ideal system by any stretch, but it was an opportunity for poor Europeans to come and pay for their way through contracted labor. They were exploited, yes. But insofar as this was an idea, it was a positive idea for people to come over here. Unfortunately, as we all know, it evolved into chattel slavery. And instead of being a temporary contract-based labor system, it became an ec a grinding economic system of oppression. And it became race-based. It was hereditary. And, but the institution of slavery, of course, continued to evolve over time. And with that evolution, you also had evolution in various other social laws. There were free Africans that had already lived in the United States. They were being stripped of social rights. They couldn't serve on juries. They couldn't vote. Um, and as we progressed toward the founding era, you, you had the uh, geographic isolation of slavery. Slavery became mostly a southern issue. It had mostly died in the north. But, and you have people like Thomas Jefferson who wrote the beautiful words of the Declaration of Independence, very egal egalitarian document in, in, pra in theory, but of course, he talked about slavery as a necessary evil. He famously talked about holding a wolf by the ears and you dare not let it go. And this sort of understanding uh, evolved further as we got closer to the Civil War, where slavery was no longer viewed as a necessary evil. It was a positive good. It was God granted. Um, people use the Bible to, to, uh, to justify this. And, but the North had maintained that sort of Jeffersonian theory. It was, it, it wasn't, it was just part of, it was part of life. The North wasn't full of abolitionists. We'd, we'd like to think that they were, but of course they were not. They were not egalitarians. But they were thinking, this is part of life. This is what we're going to do. We, we don't like slavery. We understand that it's bad. But we don't, we, we're not going to try and get rid of it. It's, it's protected by the Constitution. And of course, we go along with the Southern propaganda that the slaves were happy, that this was something that was absolutely positive good. But as the war approached, uh, future President Lincoln talked about how the United States was going to have to be either fully free or fully slaved. He, he foresaw that this was not, these systems could not live in harmony together. And outside of the slaves, of course, I don't think anyone understood that better than the, than the Union soldiers who went into the South and saw what slavery was doing. And there's a great book by Chandler Manning, it's actually in the gift shop I saw, I highly recommend picking it up, called What This Cruel War Was Over. And one of the things she did was go and find the, trans, the, um, the correspondence from the, uh, from the soldiers home and how horrified they were when they saw what the institution of slavery was. People in the North, again, knew that it was bad. But they never saw it. They, might, they, they didn't probably like the fugitive slave law. They, they might have seen black people coming you know, as servants uh, from, the, from the South. But it was not something that they had day-to-day -day contact with. They, they understood slavery as just something that happened, something that was far away. And that brings us to today. 
Now, we're 150 years after emancipation. We try to think of ourselves as a rather free society, an enlightened society. And what we try to think of is, you know, progress. We know we're not a perfect nation yet. We don't have anything as just horribly racist and awful as chattel slavery, and I do agree with that statement. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a grinding injustice that is still currently going on in this country. And my work in the criminal justice system gets me up close and personal with, with some of this injustice. Now, we're a nation of laws. And if you break those laws, you should be held accountable. I don't argue that, absolutely true. But those laws should be based on violating other people's rights. This should not just be, oh, we, well, we deem this wrong, and so we're going to throw you in a cage. And so we think about, as we think about the criminal justice system and what the reformers have been talking about recently, we think of what's been dubbed mass incarceration. And we have, almost, we have more than two million people in jails and in prisons around this country. Two million. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners. We are the land of the free, right? And yet this is what we're doing. And what you hear about when you think about mass incarceration is usually the nonviolent drug offenders. That they, you know, you, there's a first time offender gets a draconian sentence of 45 years in federal prison. That's true, it happens. But that's not the sum of what's going on. It's not the sum of what's wrong. And it is actually, incarceration isn't the only sum, isn't the sum of what's wrong. It's the entire justice system. And I, I'll take each part in turn. Uh, first, I'll talk about policing. Uh, then I'll talk about what happens in the courtroom. And then I'll finish up with uh, in jails and prisons. So what does policing look like these days? It used to be, it, it, particularly in the cities, policing started off as sort of a, a patronage job. You worked for um, a political party, you did social services, you weren't particularly skilled at much of anything. Um, it, you were politically reactive, but you weren't, very, you weren't trained very well. Well, we professionalized police over time. And one of the, th the outcroppings of this was it became, we started measuring what they were doing. And this is a very, a very abbreviated history of the police. But we're tr trying to think of, set measures for people. And so you start measuring like how many arrests they make how many tickets they offer, how, much, you know, how many drugs they turn in, how much cash they catch. And so you start looking, about, looking around at what policing looks like today. Now I think many people in this room who had personal contact with the police probably had it getting pulled over on the, on the road, right? You're, you're driving down the highway, you're, you're not paying attention to how fast you're going, the lights pop on behind you, you're like, oh, man. And, and, and you deal with that, and that is one way that the, the policing operates. You, they come up to your car, they talk about whether or not you're speeding, you, hopefully you get out of the ticket, but if you don't, it's an inconvenience and you go on about your way. But that's not every traffic stop. There is a type of traffic stop that happens primarily in poor black and brown communities, and it's called a pretextual stop. And what this is, is an officer will pull you over because it's just something's wrong with your car. Maybe you have something hanging from your windshield, a little light behind, uh, by your license plate is burned out, your tail lights out, you don't even know it, and you're pulled over. Now, he can talk to you about that issue, but that's just a pretext for why he stopped you. Then he starts asking, where are you going? What are you doing around here? You know there's a lot of guns and drugs around here. You, you don't have any in the car, do you? You, mind if I, you don't mind if I search your car, right? This is, in, this is a roadside interrogation. He has no reason to believe that any criminal behavior is going on. If he did have probable cause to believe that there was a crime going on, he wouldn't need your permission. But he will trick you to try and get you to, to give up your rights. And the fact of the matter is, if you're young, poor, and black, you don't, do you really want to say no to a police officer? You know what's going to happen, or you know what could happen. This is how we police our neighborhoods. This is how we police our poor black neighborhoods. This is not right. There was, a, there was a case, and it's not just in cars. There was a case a couple years ago, it's called U.S. v. Gross. It made up to the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And Judge Janice Rogers Brown wrote a concurrence in the piece. Uh, and I've, obviously I'm paraphrasing, I don't have her words directly in front of me. But the concurrence, she wrote, all right, 
So what the government wants me to believe, and what the Supreme Court says I must believe, is that the gun recovery units that work in Southeast DC, that come out of cars, maybe with their guns drawn, the officers are wearing tactical gear, they approach an individual or individuals and ask them if they're carrying weapons and ask them if they can search them. And the law says that that is freely given consent without coercion. She's like, okay, let's try a thought experiment. Try that in Georgetown. She never mentioned race throughout the entire con concurrence. But everyone in this room who knows the, ge the geography of DC knows that Southeast is a poor black area and knows that Georgetown is a rich white shopping district. And, they, and she knows that there is a separate and unequal policing that is going on in the city. But the, the Supreme Court says that's legal and that's okay. And so what we have is a separate unequal policing that treats people like criminals in their own homes, in, I mean, in their own neighborhoods. And then when, when the police go in and there, there is an actual crime that's going on, they have trouble getting cooperation. Oh, I can't imagine why. <laughs> and so this is how we are policing our, our neighborhoods. Now, then we move on to the courtroom. You go by what happens on TV, there's a prosecutor, it's a defense attorney. Both are looking for justice. The, the prosecutor is putting his case together, he's got an argument, he's trying to put a bad guy away, and he's doing it in your name. And the defense attorney, he knows the story, he knows his client, he believes his client is innocent, or he's at least trying to like, mitigate the circumstances and there's going to be an argument, and there's a jury, and there's a judge to make sure that everything's fair. This is all a lie. 95 to 97% of, of the convictions in this country come by guilty, by guilty plea for plea bargaining. And a plea bargain, there's no jury. There's, no, there's very rarely a judge involved until the very end. It could be a slip of paper passed across a desk saying, you have 72 hours to, come up to either take this plea or, you get, or we go to trial. Mm -hmm. By the way, this doesn't happen as much in DC because the, DC got rid of cash bail. But in most jurisdictions in this country, you have to pay bail if you're arrested for anything. Violent crime, nonviolent crime, doesn't matter. And again, if you're getting over-policed in your poor black neighborhoods, you probably don't have $1,000 just sitting around the house to bail you out. And so you can sit two and a half years in Rikers Island prison like Khalif Browder did, being accused of stealing a backpack. He was technically innocent. He was never convicted of, any, of anything. He was beaten by guards. He was beaten by fellow inmates. He spent months in uh, solitary confinement, which, by the way, is torture. It mentally and emotionally broke him. And this is what we're doing to the people we say are innocent until proven guilty. So this plea bargain that gets offered could be no time, could be a little bit of time, but it's probably just a fraction of what you would get if you exercised your jury right, your right to a jury trial that thing you saw in Law and Order that you want to happen, that used to happen in this country, you will face so much more time if you go and you lose that it becomes a rational decision to plead guilty even if you're innocent. And I'm not saying that there are a bunch of racist cops out there planning you know, evidence on people. There are some, it happens. But the issue is the system isn't meant to find justice anymore. It is a conviction machine. Go in, go out. And if you're hanging, if you're in jail and you can't bail your, get bailed out, you're gonna lose your job. You're not gonna be able to, and that's gonna have, have trouble getting another job. You, the, the amount of time in there is a gap in your employment. You have to explain that. You can get rid of Van the Box if you want. The box on the application, have you been convicted of a felony? Have you been arrested for anything? But there's still a gap in employment. You gotta explain it somehow. And this is, and this is our system. And then, once you get to the conviction, say you take the plea, you gotta go to prison. You're in a cage. Human beings aren't meant to be caged. We want accountability, but why does it have to be a cage? And it's not just a cage. As I said, what happened to Khalif Browder? There's violence. There's sexual violence. 
there's gang violence, there's drugs, there's communicable diseases. People who've been incarcerated get, have short, shorter lifespans than the average person. We are doing damage with our criminal justice system. And all this is to ask, what is it we're trying to do? Okay, you, you shoplifted, you, 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 know, you, you robbed somebody, you got in a fight, you hurt somebody. Okay, why is the cage the answer? Are we expect them to be better people after they come out of here? It does happen. Uh, Sean Hopwood is a friend of mine. He's a, now, he robbed banks. He's, he spent 12 years in, in prison. 12 years in federal prison. He wrote amicus briefs that got, I mean, he, he wrote briefs to the court that were accepted by the Supreme Court of the United States. He's a law professor at Georgetown Law. He is an, he is an amazing story, and, it, it, and, it, and it's absolutely remarkable. But most people don't come out looking like Sean. They don't come out, you know, with an education and all that. And we, and we deny these people opportunities all the time. You, see, you hear these stories about uh, prisoners being denied books and, and, you know, opportunities to better themselves. It's absolutely, it's absolutely just <laughs> insane. So what do we do about it? Well, as I said, the prosecutor does this in your name. Every time he brings a case, he says, the people of the United States, people of the state of New York, people of the District of Columbia, against this person. It's up to us to tell the government that they should not do this in our name anymore. This is not something that I'm com comfortable with. Yes, I, I want people to be held accountable for their crimes, but the ca like a cage, I, I don't understand that. There are, there are plenty of places around the world that don't use cages. If people need to be off the street, that's fine. Get them off the street. But then treat them humanely and get them the help that they need for whatever it is. Most of the people who are incarcerated have severe mental health problems. And then of course, while they're incarcerated, they don't necessarily have the medications that they need to behave properly. And then they're punished for misbehaving because they're not on their meds. <coughs> this is the, ins the bu bureaucratic insanity of our system. Now we can talk about whether the system is racist. Of course, the system has racial impacts. But it's not like there's some guy holding the string somewhere saying, oh, we're going to do this. No, it's just how policy evolved. <coughs> and, it's, and it is part and parcel of the legacy of slavery. Don't get me wrong. This is our, this is our legacy. It's our legacy of our country. It's a legacy of everything that we've built. But, you know, I, I do want to end on a hopeful note. <laughs> um, you know, there, there, you, you see what happened in Philadelphia. The, the district attorney, uh, Larry Krasner, was elected. He was his former um, defense attorney. And he, he st started changing things right away. He dismissed a whole lot of prosecutors that had been there for a very long time who didn't really care much about justice, just, you know, working the conviction machine. And he, he said, we're, we're no longer taking small, you know, minor marijuana cases. It doesn't sound like a lot, but the number one reason to get arrested in this country is simple drug possession. And as I said, it's not just who gets incarcerated. It's how they're policed. It, if you look at the data where marijuana has been legalized, pretextual stops like I described have declined precipitously. Because they're no longer, if, if they're not looking for the drugs, there's no reason to search the car. And so it just becomes getting police back to what they're supposed to do, supposed to make us safer, to, to make the community better, instead of occupying the community and terrorizing the people who live there. So I hope that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, or a shorter time if possible, <laughs> that people who sit in this room will look back at our system today with the horror and the shock that it deserves because the system is not, has no place in the land of the free and it is an absolute disgrace. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. We've heard um, an interesting series of encounters of the personal with associations like the KKK and institutions 
like our universities and uh, our justice system. And now our next speaker, Jennifer Mendelssohn, is going to take it deeper into the personal encounters with history and her description of uh, resistance genealogy, diving deeper into our own past and the past of many others. The DNA is in the records and the genealogy. And uh, as a result, uh, Jennifer Mendelssohn, a seasoned journalist and writer, has delved into her own personal family history and deep genealogy, but also those of others who have been uh, advocates for attacking the kinds of progress we've heard uh, is, as needed to address the injustices in our criminal justice system, the injustices in universities and the unequal treatment of, uh, of gender issues or discrimination or in attacking the associations that are white supremacist. So in her work, she has been looking at, she's watching the Watchmen. Uh, and uh, it'll be very interesting to hear from her, a former People Magazine special correspondent and Slate correspondent columnist. Uh, her work has appeared in numerous local and national publications, most recently in The New Yorker of just a few weeks ago. Based in Baltimore, she's passionately engaged in the genealogy world, and I'll remind everyone, that's almost a $3 billion business uh, in this country. And it serves on the board of the Jun Jewish Genealogical Society of Maryland. She's a founder of Resistance Genealogy, hashtag Resistance Genealogy, uh, a project that uses the uh, historical record to fight disinformation. And let's hear it for how uh, bringing the personal in to show the universality of the entire immigrant and migrant experience can really uh, empower many other voices, not just individual genealogy. Uh, Jennifer Mendelssohn. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the people of Lincoln Cottage, to uh, Aaron and Zach and Kelly for inviting me and for recognizing my work. Um, thank you to the other esteemed speakers. It's a pleasure to be in your company. I'm still getting used to being out front. I'm used to being behind the scenes. I've been a journalist for 20 years telling other people's stories and it's been incredibly enlightening and at times alarming to be the one who is the story. Um, I think of the time when resistance genealogy uh, went really big in January and I was sort of inundated with uh, media requests. I'm usually the one making the requests. My 86-year-old uh, mother on Long Island called all in a tizzy and she said a producer from CNN had just called her looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that's been a very new experience. Um, but uh, I'm also delighted to be here at Lincoln Cottage in the shadow of Lincoln and I do hope that um, telling my story of how I did become an accidental activist. I did not intend to start an international movement, um, and I did quite serendipitously uh, that maybe that will be instructive to others. I had been looking for a way to use my voice and ended up landing on it through a series of coincidences, which I'm now going to tell you about. My story is a bit more personal than some of the others um, that have been presented today. But it's also very much an illustration of uh, the idea that brings us here today, which is that we cannot escape history. My project very specifically demands that we use the lessons of history as a lens to get perspective on events in the present day. I found that both in my own very personal story of exploring my own family history. I found that had an enormous impact on my day-to-day -day life and then I took it one step further. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about this series of um, serendipitous, serendipitous events that uh, led me to be here, and I found a very unusual way to speak truth to power uh, in a way that made use of what I love the most and what I found what I was most passionate about. Um, I also know that we're here in Lincoln's Cottage, but as a proud graduate of the University of Virginia, I would be remiss to point out that it's the birthday of my other favorite American president, Thomas Jefferson. So I feel like, I hope that's not sacrilege to bring up here, but. <laughs> um, so 
when the uh, origin story of resistance genealogy is you know, told for the ages, I am going to invent a much better story. Um, I'm going to make it something very weighty. You know, maybe it'll have to do with Kalel and Krypton. But the truth is <laughs> that the entire reason that I am standing here before you and that my work has been recognized, um, it all began with a Facebook post in May of 2013. Um, what that Facebook post was about was about a GoFundMe. Um, we've all seen them a million times. I noticed that a number of people that I knew from college were posting a link to a GoFundMe to fund a documentary that was being made by someone we had gone to college with that I did not know, but with whom I had many, many mutual friends. So I clicked on it. And the GoFundMe was, uh, this, this person was making a documentary about a matzah factory on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, the Streitz Matzah Factory, which had been at the same location on Rivington Street since 1925. And it had been in the family for five generations, and it was the only continuously family-owned matzah factory still in existence. Now, it's very important to remember that at that point in 2013, I had zero interest in genealogy. Um, I, some people in this room may be familiar with my brother, who's a, a fairly well-known writer named Daniel Mendelssohn. And about 10 years ago, my brother wrote a book telling the story of what happened to our family during the Holocaust. That became an international bestseller, um, quite well-known. And I actually accompanied my brothers on one of the trips we took back to our ancestral hometown. But genealogy was Daniel's thing. It was not my thing. I was not interested. But this story of this matzo factory sounded so interesting and so intriguing, and I sort of had this, you know, several of my grandparents grew up on the Lower East Side, um, and I thought, what a great story. I'm a storyteller. I love stories. And the other thing that happened when I started to read about this documentary that was being made was the name Rivington Street jumped out at me, because I remembered that my mother had cousins who lived on Rivington Street. My mother had always told me, Cousin Max sold bagels on Rivington Street. So I did something that, in retrospect, makes absolutely no sense. But here you have it, serendipity. I Googled. And, and then I thought, well, whatever happened to those cousins? I, we don't talk to them anymore. I Googled their names and Rivington Street. Nothing should have come up. But actually, what came up was a link to Ancestry.com and the 1940 census. And it showed me that those very cousins were living on Rivington Street. It had their names, it had their ages, it had their places of birth. And there they were, Miriam, Max, and their daughter Zelda. He was listed as being a truck driver for a, uh, a bakery, hence the bagels. Um, and it said, that they had, it said where they had lived in 1935, and it said Woodbine, New Jersey. And I said, oh my god, that's totally them, because I knew that my cousin Miriam's father was actually the mayor of Woodbine, New Jersey. And I thought to myself, wow. This is so cool. I had no idea that you could search the census. So I sort of clicked. And then I said, wow, I'm going to find my parents in the 1940 census. Then I said, I'm going to find my grandparents in the 1940 census and my great grand. You know how this story goes. <laughs> so the next thing I knew, I had a subscription to Ancestry.com. <laughs> and I fell down the rabbit hole of genealogy. Um, as I said, it was not something I'd ever been interested in before, but it suddenly, I realized that, you know, as someone who likes to tell stories and who likes to report stories, I realized that genealogy was sort of a perfect marriage for all of the things that interested me. Storytelling, fact-seeking, myth-debunking, um, and up to that point I had sort of established a reputation on social media as being someone who liked to debunk, debunk myths. I'd done some work looking at um, sort of viral internet stories and trying to get to the bottom of them. Bottom of them. I mean, I've been, I was trained as a fact checker at Time Life Books a million and a half years ago. Getting facts was very important to me. People talk a lot about receipts. Um, I'm all about getting the receipts. And I realized that genealogy is a place where you can do nothing but look at receipts. Um, and it's fascinating because often those receipts tell a very different story than the story you thought you were going to find. Um, you know, I like to joke that we genealogists are the ones who know that, you know, Aunt Edna was actually five years older than she told everybody. Um, I came across one relative in the census who consistently, in every single census, 
said that he was English, he was British. I have his birth certificate from Riga, Latvia. This is, you know, <laughs> he was not British. Even his children had no idea. Um, so, um, so I fell down this genealogy rabbit hole. And it's interesting because I went back as I was preparing uh, for this talk to look at how much time had elapsed um, in between uh, seeing that Facebook post and what I'm about to tell you. And I, I thought it was a really long time, but it was actually uh, a couple of weeks. So I got on uh, Ancestry, uh, I saw that post in the middle of May, and by Memorial Day weekend, I had sort of immersed myself in genealogy and, you know, had sort of finding, started finding all this amazing stuff on my, on my own family, records and documents. And so um, I would not be standing here today if that little uh, detour into genealogy had not serendipitously uh, turned out that my very first outing as a genealogist, I hit the equivalent of a Grand Slam home run, you know, in the bottom of the ninth inning, because this is what happened. My husband uh, had a 95-year-old grandmother who was a Holocaust survivor from Poland. Um, she was 95 in May of 2013 when this happened. And uh, her family story was actually the perfect inverse of mine. Um, I am the granddaughter, three of my four grandparents were immigrants. Um, I have only one grandmother was, who was born on the Lower East Side, not far from Rivington Street, two immigrant uh, parents. And in my family, when I started to get on Ancestry and look at my tree, every single story was about immigration. It was about naturalization papers, it was when did they come, it was, you know, it was all about getting out of Europe and coming here. Unfortunately, my husband's family was the inverse. His grandmother and his grandfather were the sole survivors of their entire extended families. They fled Poland in the fall of 1939, right after the Germans invaded. They, I always say, the story of how they survived the war could be you know, a book and its own, its own Lincoln Cottage Ideas Forum. It's extraordinary, but unfortunately, every single, with one or two exceptions, member of their families were murdered in the Holocaust. Nobody survived. So, two weeks after I saw this Facebook post, I, uh, I was sitting in the car with this 95-year-old woman who had lost her entire family, and I was just trying to make conversation. And I thought to myself, you know, I've never asked her this. She was born in 1917 in this tiny little town in Poland, and I'm, you know, I know from what I've been doing that that was a time when millions upon millions of Eastern European immigrants were trying to get to America. So I said, Mama, when you were growing up, was there a lot of buzz about going to America? Did people talk about going to America? And she looked at me very imperiously, as she was wont to do, and she said, no, not really. I said, OK. And then she said as an afterthought, well, you know, my mother had two older sisters who went to Chicago before World War I. She was supposed to join them, but the war broke out. And as I once told the story, I said, if, the, if this were the cartoon version, this is the point at which sort of my eyes bug horizontally out of my head. I was just like, what are you talking? You had ants? And it like, you know, and I, I remember sort of flipping through my mental Rolodex thinking, you know, she has like one cousin that I know in Miami. She had some other distant cousins. And I'm thinking these are clearly like those people if she had aunts who came here, you know, whatever. I said, I said which, which cousins are those, those aunts who went to Chicago? And she sort of sighed, and this look came over her face, and she said, I don't know. And I said, what do you mean? She said, my mother lost touch with them. Something happened during the war. I, I, never, I never knew what, what became of them. And she said, when she got to America in 1958, and it breaks my heart to think about you know, this sort of pre-internet universe, she did the one thing she knew how to do to try to find them. There was one guy from their hometown who sort of knew what had happened to everybody after the war, so she wrote him a letter. He lived in Chicago, and she said, can you tell me where my aunts are? I know they're here somewhere. She never heard back, so she let it go. She went on with her life. She raised four children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, forgot all about it until that morning in May 2013. I looked at her and I said, we are going to find what happened to them. So, to make an extremely long story short, as I said, I went on my first genealogical expedition. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I mean, I sort of, I'm a reporter, I kind of know how to tell a story and follow, in, 
But I was like, I need to find these two ladies who came from this town and, you know, whatever. Um, oh, <laughs> the very important minor detail was she didn't know their last names. <laughs> you know. Well, I found them. Uh, it took me two weeks. I, as I've said many times, ignored everyone and everything. You know, they were like, the house was a mess. The children were barely fed. I sat at my computer and I just kept thinking to myself, this woman has lost everyone she ever knew. Somewhere out there is a blood relative. You know, how can I sleep at night if I haven't done everything in my power to make this happen for her? So at the end of two weeks, I went over to her apartment and I sat her down. I said, Mama, I have some news for you. You have three first cousins. So we found them. This woman who had lost everybody, it turned out that she had three living first cousins who had no idea that she existed. She had no idea that they existed. And it was the most extraordinary experience of my entire life. I mean, nothing I ever do before or since will ever be as important as reuniting them. And we learned during one of the first conversations that one of them had the same Hebrew name as her mother, which was like incredibly powerful and meaningful. And I was able to, you know, give her back something that she had lost. And then I was like, wow, <laughs> you know. This stuff has some power. This is, you know, this is extraordinary. It was such a. Oh, okay. Um, we got we we got to we we got to flip ahead here. Okay, so uh, we do that. We find that genealogy has great power, and then I uh, spend a lot of time doing genealogy on myself, doing genealogy for other people, volunteering to do what I did for her. I reunited adoptees with their family. I uh, I. Uh, volunteered on Facebook pages for people who needed lookups. I was good at this, I was a natural at it, I started to do it. And I also started to wonder how can I make this more part of my life. Um, on Super Tuesday of 2016, it suddenly dawned on me because I was watching the CNN uh, Super Tuesday while I was hunched on my laptop, and it wasn't because I was tracking the returns, it was because I had just made contact with a third cousin of mine who gave me the names of an entire branch of my family that I knew nothing about. And for a genealogist, that's like a gold mine, and I was so excited. I was typing in all their names, and unfortunately, one by one, every single name that I put up would lead me to uh, ancestry databases called things like concentration camp victims and survivors, list of murdered Jews from Germany. This entire branch of my family had been decimated during the war. And I'm watching that literally as I'm watching the election returns and Trump you know, trouncing everybody on Super Tuesday. And all of a sudden the light bulb went off. And I thought, this little historical pocket that I am retreating into with genealogy is not a historical pocket. This has incredible resonance and relevance to what is going on in the world today. I wonder what I can do with that. So I began to use my personal experience to speak out about the events in the world. When the Muslim ban was enacted in January of 2017, I knew viscerally and intuitively what was happening because I have the letters that my doomed uncle wrote out of Poland in 1939 when he was desperate to get a visa to America and was unable to. And he writes heartbreakingly that he's going to write a letter to President Roosevelt, which he misspells R-O-S-I-W-E-L-T, and tell him that I have family in America. Maybe that will move him and he'll, he'll get me out. He did not get out. So I started tweeting out those letters. These are not abstract policies these people were enacting. I knew the, the very human cost of those, so, those sorts of policies. Um, and then that week was the week that Senator Schumer cried at a press conference discuss, discussing the Muslim ban, and he was mocked by the president. I knew intuitively why Chuck Schumer was crying because I know Chuck Schumer comes from an Eastern European, New York Jewish family, and it took me three seconds. I didn't actually do Senator Schumer's tree at that point, but I Googled and I found multiple interviews where he talked about the fact that his great-grandmother and seven of her nine children were murdered by the Nazis. I knew that's what fueled those tears, so I tweeted something about that, and it went viral. I should also add, 
that because of that viral tweet, that was the first time that I learned that there can be scary uh, consequences and downsides to being so out front. That was the first time I got uh, hate directed at me. Somebody I found had posted my picture on Facebook um, and used all sorts of epithets that I probably can't repeat in this lovely setting, um, but said specifically, this is the face of the enemy, America. And that was all for saying that Chuck Schumer had a Holocaust history and that's why he was crying. Um, so uh, then I began uh, the, the, the project uh, in earnest. Um, when Steve King of Iowa said we can't restore our civilization with other people's babies, I hopped on Ancestry.com. And I thought, who is the other in that scenario? We all are other people's babies if you go back far enough. <laughs> And there it was in black and white. Steve King's grandmother came as a baby on a boat to Ellis Island in 1894. Boom. <laughs> when Tucker Carlson of Fox News asked, why does America benefit from having tons of people from failed countries come here? I hopped on Ancestry.com and discovered that Tucker Carlson's great-great-grandfather, Cesar Lombardi, very helpfully wrote memoirs that are in the archives of Rice University, in which he talked about the fact that the prospects in his native Switzerland were so bleak that in 1860, he had no choice but to come to America. <laughs> I found that Fox News' Tommy Lauren, uh, who has been, you know, who's repeated every trope about illegals and bye bye if you're not here legally, uh, I discovered that her great-great-grandfather was indicted by, indicted by a federal grand jury in North Dakota in 1917 for forging his naturalization papers. Uh, he was acquitted at trial. I'm always careful to point that out. Uh, and then, uh, uh, perhaps most famously, in January of this year, when chain migration became the epithet of choice um, used by the right to uh, denigrate the very normal and healthy and perfectly legal process by which we allow immigrants into this country, which is to allow them to reunite with their families, uh, I found that White House uh, social media director Dan Scavino was uh, tweeting nastily about chain migration, and I thought, Scavino? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, luckily for Dan, um, I had just worked an adoption case using Sicilian records and was very familiar with how to trace Italian families. So, I hopped on Ancestry.com and discovered that Dan Scavino Jr. is here as the White House social media director in 2018 because of one of the nicest, tidiest chains of migrants I have ever seen. <laughs> uh, his great-grand uncle Victor came first, brought over his great-grand uncle Hector, who brought over his great-grandfather Gildo, who then brought sister Esther, who then brought sister Clotilda and their father and Clotilda's uh, son. So there you have it. Um, so this, uh, I, have, I had jokingly slapped the hashtag resistance genealogy on the project, and it has become an international movement. Um, it has generated interest all over the world, and it, as I said, was this completely accidental. I wasn't intending to start a movement. I wasn't trying to uh, generate media attention. It happened completely organically and completely accidentally. And I continue to do it. I just did share up Joe Arpaio's tree. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he, he's also a, a very uh, neat and tidy uh, chain migration story. Uh, and I guess uh, 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 to close, I'm supposed to wrap up. So, uh, I, I want to make clear that this project, a lot of people have used the term shame. Um, uh, I'm trying to shame people. I'm really not trying to shame anybody. I am trying to show the commonality of the immigrant experience to this country. Um, I find it fascinating. One of my favorite moments in this genealogical journey that I had was when I was working on this adoption case with Sicilian Records. It dawned on me one day in this sort of nice little moment. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I had someone who was helping me translate the Italian, um, and he showed me, he, he sent me a translation of one of the birth records I needed to help do this adoption case. And I sort of, something about it seemed really familiar. And I realized that the language in this Sicilian Catholic birth record was absolutely almost word for word identical as the birth certificate of my great great grandfather who was born Jewish in Krakow, Poland in 1848. Almost word for word. And I just kept thinking, people are people. No matter the color of their skin, no matter the way that they pray, no matter the community that they live in, people do things the same way all over the world. They have families, they have marriages, they have children, they die, they, you know, it's all the same. So that's really what I'm trying to do with this, um, with this project. It's also 
also a way that we can connect to people across the political table. I have nothing in common with Dan Scavino or Kellyanne Conway except our immigrant roots, which are almost identical. You know, <laughs> mine happen to be Eastern European Jewish, but it's all the same story that we're telling, basically. Um, I realize, you know, some of us see in the, in the wave of current immigrants um, who are browner than our forefathers were typically, who come from places that aren't as familiar to us, but we see the same thing. We see families trying to establish themselves here and give their children greater opportunity. You know, I am the great-granddaughter of a woman who was illiterate. My brother holds a PhD from Princeton. You know, that's the sort of opportunity I see available, and I want to make that opportunity available to everyone, regardless of where they come from or how humble they're, you know, they, when they talk about merit-based immigration, like, don't get me started. But um, I guess to close, I'll say if there's, if there's one thing uh, you should take away from the project, it's the, it's the catchphrase I've been using, which is that people in genealogical glass houses shouldn't throw stones. <laughs> and in America, the vast majority of us live in genealogical glass houses. So thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, and uh, it's my opportunity to open things up for some questions, and, but, I, but it's clear that in the sense of effective public history, if we recognize our own limits as persons, but also the institutional truths of what we represent and we reckon with those, that's not shaming, that's getting to know the past. And in doing so, we come to a third thing, a shared sense of ourselves, a shared humanity. The only way to, es we, can es we cannot escape history, but the only way to do so, if we see it as a trap, is to go through history. And all of our speakers have spoken to that. Let me ask you, what surprised you? How should places like Lincoln Cottage tell these stories? And what are you willing to do? based on what you heard today, to go out and escape history? <laughs> question. Yes, please. One question for Mr. Uh, David. Yes, sir. Did you ever find out the scriptures that were used in the <laughs> In the Bible? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I, yeah, yes, I did. Uh, I don't remember the exact chapter and verse, but it's in uh, Leviticus. And like with many um, denominations of Christianity, you have the same Bible of each denomination, whether oh, yes. it's Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, yes. whatever, takes that verse and twists it and do their own narrative. But the, I'm going to paraphrase, it's in Leviticus somewhere. Uh, it said, because he pointed it out to me, and I, and I read it, it says something to the effect of, a lamb shall not lay with a wolf. I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I said, what does that mean? And he said that two different species shall not lay together. And I said, yeah, but whites and blacks are not two different species. We're the same species, two different colors. Oh, no, 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 we're two different species. So that was his justification. <laughs> what else surprised you? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this question is for Mr. Bay. Blank, is that? Blanks. I sometimes cut up. That's all right. Um, your fear punishment project, I like the fact that you started out that you did start off as an unequal society, and we still are there today. You talked about the pre structural stops. I just read something from Route 50. They send these publications about the different states and what's going on in them. And they talked about <coughs> risk assessments that are used for sentencing. And in those risk assessments, it gave me an understanding of how a judge sometimes can overrule the prosecutor 
based on the risk assessment that's used throughout the justice system. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> complicated. It's due toward blacks being more higher risk than well, others. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, discretion is based in, baked into our system. Okay. And so, I don't know if you would say unfortunately, I, well, I mean, certainly unfortunately that it does impact disparately in racial issues. It, we found out once, uh, not our particular organization, but we found that there's a judge in Louisiana that sentenced black defendants more harshly after LSU lost. I mean, <laughs> like, like this, it, that sort of, that discretion that, that can come from the system. What we have right now is a, 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 like a collective mindset that says our job is to punish people. And this machinery of injustice, we're just gonna like crank it up. If so we see something that's wrong, we're just gonna crank up the sentence even more. And it's not really doing anything. And so what we need to do is start thinking about what we're trying to do with the criminal justice system. Are we trying to make these better people? Are we trying to make uh, society safer? Or are we just trying to punish people? And right now, it's still in that punishment phase where it's just like, we can talk about risk assessment, we can talk about various angles that people are taking, but it's still just like, punish, punish, punish. And until we stop, until we change that mindset, it's gonna continue. Is it a mindset or is it a constitution? Um, it depends on the jurisdiction, but it, right now it's just because of the, the discretion that's baked, basic, baked into the system and, the, and the, uh, where they're allowed to deviate from, uh, from the law. Yes, ma'am. I want to address Mr. Banks one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, the, uh, whether it's to punish, uh, there, there's a profit motive. Did you, did you look at that? Oh, uh, of, of, of course there is. <laughs> of course there is. No, I, I, mean, I, I didn't have a whole lot of time. I could have I gone further into that. So there's this, uh, oh, sorry, I cut you off, didn't I? I'm sorry. Well, you can go ahead. Okay, okay sorry. Um, so you have like civil forfeiture, right? That's another reason why they'll search your car. If you find cash or you find a little bit of drugs and they can say that you, uh, you're you using that car for, uh, for to sell the drugs, they can seize the car, even though the, the, the person was borrowing the car. And then they can seize that and sell it. And they can, and, uh, they can keep the profit for that. Um, you have, or, you have set drug uh, task forces that will set up on the outbound from cities uh, highways because the, the assumption is that the drugs and guns go in and then the money comes out. And so they'll set up on the outward bound to get the cash because they can't sell the guns and the drugs. <laughs> and so that they will set up just to get the cash from the asset forfeiture. So yes, that's a problem. We're trying to, make sh to end that practice as well. As far as like the larger system with like prisons, Yes, private prisons exist, but they only hold 6% of our prisoners. Only six. And the problem is, is the supply is too high. The prosecutors are sending too many people there. Private prisons exist because our public prisons got too full. And the, if you don't change the, in, like the inputs, it doesn't matter who's taking it. If it's, if, it's the, if it's the private prison or if it's a public prison with their unions, it doesn't matter. It's still the system. The, the prosecutors are the key. You need to start charging people less, finding alternatives to incarceration, because that's the problem. It's not just, the, the prison just takes what, it, what are given to them. They're, they're not out there stopping people. They're not out doing that. The, the systems are completely separate that way. Professor, can I, can I just add that the profit motive, there's a new book by the great Peter Edelman, with which you're into the field. It's called, It's Not a Crime to Be Poor. It just came out, and it addresses the whole issue of, particularly saying as taxation has lowered, Jurisdictions have had to make money other ways, they, wow. and so they continue to expand it, exploiting the poor. Wow. So, can I, Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you, uh, you had had your I hand up. I had a general question that sort of brings Jennifer's and Gerald's pieces together. Um, I was listening to your story, it was so riveted, and it was this incredible ending that they, they actually left the clan. Like, that's extraordinary. And then I was thinking of your people who are being what you're trying to do, which is amazing, um, but sort of to re reveal the common humanity. And so I just feel like, sadly, it's just, I, I'm sad that I, I, I that I want to believe in your results and I believe, I don't know, philosophically or emotionally in what you're saying, but I just feel like these people who, whose, you know, immigrant roots are being revealed, they're, they, they know their immigrant roots, mm -hmm. and they're making these horrendous, horrible policies. Like, mm -hmm. so where I want to believe that education in our common humanity is transformative, I, 
know. Well, we, my, I cut my teeth and I cut my teeth in public history interviewing Holocaust survivors as part of the Shoah project. And my first interview, my car wouldn't start and I was late and I got up to Northeast Philadelphia and I was to interview a man who had lost all 15 of his siblings in the Holocaust and he was the only survivor of his family. And I said, I, I'm late, I'm afraid I'm gonna ruin the interview. And he said, don't hurry, bad news. <laughs> and if anyone was gonna have perspective, yeah. it's a fellow who had lost so much family. So the, you don't meet too many optimistic historians. Let's not, let's not, uh, let's not, so please, Catherine. I'm optimistic you might call me. So I wanted to raise the optimism that we are talking about change and someone wrote, brought up culture and change and you are enormously enriching by having a perspective on a home that changes it. That comes out of the literature and the scholarship. Mm -hmm. I was a graduate of the Department of Afro-American Studies at Harvard, which has changed its name twice, but it's become a powerhouse. Its endowment now rivals that of the classics department. Mm -hmm. I think that the establishment of the slave narrative as America's contribution to literature, as jazz, as uh, America's contribution, and both of those derived from African American culture, is something that has been really transformative in 21st century America. So although we look at these things very bleakly, I sort of remember, although my, my bleaker. Russia, bleaker, yeah, my Russia example doesn't hold very well, or China with the transformations <laughs> there, but at least we can say that culturally America is, from living and teaching abroad, you know, viewed as a nation that is free and is also uh, struggling with its enslavement legacy, struggling to be the nation of many people, e pluribus unum, that it started out as, by confronting these terrible issues, by looking at Mr. Jefferson and his legacy in a different way in the 21st century, by looking at the KKK, even doing it one at a time. I, I think we have to be, and you're saying, we keep using the phrase escape history, and I guess just as an historian who's looking at uh, the way in which history is being battered and abused and misused. I think we need to embrace history and have many histories coming together. So that's what we kind of do here. And that's a really important message. As agents in these changes, we, we can ourselves be um, forceful. We can be verbs in the dialogue. Yes. Well, just uh, I was in response to what you said, thinking that they might not, they might have known their family history perfectly well, but you're also restoring it to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. And it's um, just this terrible current tendency to, um, to erase history, you know, to, to not just escape it, but to rewrite it. Mm -hmm. And um, to forget very quickly our own immigrant stories or to obscure them to the larger community. So I think that revealing that um, you know, is, is an important step forward. Mm -hmm. I was doing a little volunteer project uh, for a Minnesota public history site, and my mother's hometown is the hotbed of pro-Trump, you know, southern Minnesota, just like Wisconsin, Trump signs everywhere, and I took great delight in writing little articles on uh, this Minopedia site that reminded people that the town was formed as a socialist experiment <laughs> by 48ers who had to get out of Germany. Germany. And it, though, but, uh, they were great believers in equality, freedom, education. Everything Trump has done. And there are many, many examples. Can uh, speak to that? Please, Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to add, I. I sort of didn't time this talk very well. I, I did want to speak to this, but what you're getting at is, a, is, a, is an essential piece of the work I'm doing, which is to remember that, as I said recently in an op-ed, looking down on the newest wave of immigrants is a right of American passage. Yes. And right. that's what people are forgetting. And again, it's funny because I come to this not because I'm a historian, not because I've studied immigration history. I come to this from personal experience. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was born in New York City. 
and her sisters, who were also born in New York City, were horrified that she wanted to marry my grandfather because he was straight off the boat. And when I went back and looked at our history, I thought, huh, that's funny. That aunt was born in New York City in 1895. Hang on, let me look. Their mother arrived in 1891. You know, it, it, it takes so little time for people to say, well, we're American now, and those, ne you know, and I've, I've written about this, you know, in 1751, Benjamin Franklin was worried that the Germans were never going to assimilate in Pennsylvania. In 1896, the Atlantic bemoaned the current immigrants and talked about the ones of 30 and 50 years ago who were so industrious and smart and wonderful. That was in 1896, before President and Trump's mother was born before, you know, before any of these people. So that is a constant theme. And to speak to it specifically, I had a wonderful experience um, on Twitter. There was a, a gentleman, he's a, he's a healthcare poli poli policy analyst in Florida. He has quite a Twitter following and he's horribly anti-immigrant. That's sort of his entire brand. And he had one of these tweets go viral talking about you know, imagine somebody knocks at your door and they don't speak English and they take all your food and, you know, and people, people loved it and it was horrible. And I found a tweet of his in which he talked about his own family and he said, my Polish immigrant ancestors came here the right way and they learned English and they, you know, fought in the World War and blah, 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 blah. So I hopped on ancestry. <laughs> I found his family in the census, and his great-grandfather had been here for 14 years and still didn't speak English. So, and, and even worse, I found that that guy was an Ancestry user. He uses the same profile picture on Ancestry that he does on Twitter. It was his own tree. So the question is, is it in there, and he knows it, and he's willfully distorting it to promote his agenda? Or is he, you know, a lot of these people whose trees I've done, I have no idea. I, I'm sure Tommy Lauren did not know that her great-great-grandfather had been indicted. But, you know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a willful distortion of the past. It's a convenient uh, amnesia that people have fallen prey to. And I am just here to say, like, not on my watch, you know. <laughs> so. Excellent. How, uh, uh, other question? How yeah, I kind of follow up on that because I know I know you wrote an article recently, an co-authored article about this myth of like the clan bait. Oh God! I don't know if you want to talk about that in a second, but I guess my question is, you know, with which which I guess sticks on that real briefly. There's this right wing meme that in the 1924 Democratic National uh, Convention was like a clan rally, which is based on like one very small like offhand comment in a newspaper article. It was almost a joke from the 1920s, but I guess my larger question is with the rise of kind of fake news on, on kind of both sides and accusations of fake news, how can we kind of deal with some of these issues? And if, you know, to Zero's point earlier about we want to have conversations with people, but if people can't even believe in basic facts and think, oh, that's just fake news as like a reflexive argument, how can we actually have some of these conversations? Well, I think I, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. Yeah, I can address this, and I'll, I'll also put out a, a plea to the engaged and interested people who've taken their time on a Friday morning to come think about ideas, which is that, like I said, I started this sort of accidentally, and I'm still not sure what to do with it. I, I see what the problem is. I am not so sure of the solution, and I'm looking to find ways to use this information because, unfortunately, a lot of this is preaching to the choir. You know, people have hailed me on Twitter as, you know, a celebrity and a badass and a hero, but those are all people who are inclined to hear my message in the first place. Tucker Carlson, on the other hand, recently told the Washington Post that my project is, quote, the stupidest thing he's ever heard of. So we are not reaching the intended targets. Um, and that I find distressing. And, uh, you know, but Daryl's project shows that it's possible. You know, it's, 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 it, it's possible to change minds, possibly. Um, the clan bake story, some of you may, I, I wrote a piece for the Washington Post last month about um, how not only is fake news now a problem, but fake history is a problem because they've created this meme based on misinformation it has risen in the Google results so that when you look for information about the 1924 Democratic Convention it links to all this bad information that is not based on the historical record it's like a game of telephone a mistake got embedded got embedded got embedded and now what do you do about it and it was I co-wrote this piece with a historian at Case Western um, and you know we scoured the newspapers from 1924 you know everything we did is carefully sourced and yet there are still people on Twitter who, when presented with the story, say, oh, it ran in the Washington Post. I'm not listening to that. So, you know, it's, it's a problem, and I'm all ears if anyone has a solution. 
Well, and I, I would say that the problem goes back pretty far because we, you know, are having in the public history field to do seminars on the lost cause narrative because mm -hmm. that is, yeah. you know, a fake history that has, you know, done an incredible amount of damage ever since. And there are fake historic markers on yeah. the president's golf course, and, wow. uh, and <laughs> so it may not. It may be too high a bar to go in thinking to change someone's mind, mm -hmm. but it is possible to influence someone's thinking, and even one by one, there is that possibility. We. I know we're running out of time, but I know you've had your hand up for a while. Please. Thank you, and I'd like, here, here. And I'd also like to draw attention to the fact that there, each of these speakers is themselves an activist and an agent of change. So continue to follow their work as it uh, unfolds and perhaps a subsequent Lincoln Ideas Forum will help us trace the arc of the change that we're trying to make. Uh, and with that, I think it'd be a, a nice idea to bring this glorious Friday the 13th to a close <laughs> and remember Reconciliation Day and uh, Reconciliation Weekend and Emancipation Day on Monday, as well as the events that transpired 153 years ago tomorrow here at Lincoln Cottage. Thank you on behalf of President Lincoln's Cottage and all of our speakers. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs>